Welcome to Eschatology 101. Guys, I'm excited to talk about this topic today, and I think maybe this will help tie in some of the loose ends that we've been exploring. We've been talking about the meta narrative of Scripture, right? The idea that, that God is telling this amazing story, and this story has an ending. We've been trying to get as robust of a view as we can in the time we have. And last time we talked about this thing called the resurrection, which is actually part of God's plan for us somehow already coming into the story as it stands. In other words, the end is somehow already here mixed up with the middle of the story. How do we make sense of that? There's a word for it that theologians have come up with. The term is inaugurated eschatology. That's right, inaugurated. Like, you know what an inauguration is, right? When a king takes the throne, right? Eschatology, just a refresher there. Let's go ahead and get it out of her system. Meow. Eschatology. Meow. It's the study of the end. Inaugurated eschatology suggests that somehow God's kingdom is already setting up right now. Inaugurated eschatology suggests that God is setting up his kingdom already in the here and now. And the eschatology part of inaugurated eschatology suggests that there is still on the horizon a fullness to that kingdom being realized in the future. Are you following me? I've got some graphics to help this. Last time we ended off with a quote from one of our youth volunteers, uh, Bible scholar grandparents from Dr. Roger Decker. He said, the kingdom of heaven is here, coming and participatory. So that is that tension we're going to sit in during this Devo, okay? Here we go. There is a future and there is a present and these things are a little bit disconnected, right? They're a little, different realities in, in a sense. One way to think of it is the old order, the one that we're in now, and the new order, the one when God will fully come. This stuff gets a little tricky. The new order, so to speak, is not all the way here yet. Here's what I mean by the old order, the way things are in the here and now. And they're not that great if we're really honest about it. Yes, there's a lot of things to celebrate and, and, and we believe in this redemptive story of God. We believe in the, the fullness of the, of the story of scripture that God made a good earth. He made a, a good humanity, but we know that all of that has been compromised by sin. If we think of the, the narrative of, of the cosmos as a power struggle, the old order is a way that lives in rebellion to God. a dehumanizing legacy of sin that leads to death. The old order is a way that compromises God's good creation and makes it less than what it was intended to be. So instead of becoming more like ourselves, we actually distort ourselves in the old order. One way to think of this really is the, 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 the chief sin behind all the other sins, it seems to be replacing God with something else. There's a word for that in, in theology and, and in the Bible, it's called idolatry. This picture here is a picture of a, a Canaanite uh, little figurine. Anything that we enthrone on our hearts that is not God, anything less than the creator himself, it's something created. And what that does is it actually dehumanizes us. So what am I talking about? Well, let's take a look at a few passages. If you take a look at these related passages, they all echo the same sentiment, that turning away from God makes hearts callous, eyes blind, and ears impossible to hear. In a sense, it's as if these people who have turned away from God and the act of turning away from God is becoming like a statue, an idol, something that actually dulls the senses. Because turning away from God is actually dehumanizing oneself, making one less than fully human. It is a way of talking about people who have desensitized themselves to God's wonderful and beautiful ways of life. Maybe you could summarize what we just read in this sentiment. You become like what you worship. So the question for us and, and, and to understand our relationship with the old order and, and realize its defining characteristics, you might ask the question, what is enthroned in your heart? And if anything is enthroned in your heart that isn't God, right, that, that isn't the creator, it must be something created. Maybe it was a little more obvious with ancient Israelite religion and Greco-Roman religion in the context of the New and the Old Testament. 
that they literally had statues or uh, pictures, uh, icons that they they worshipped, and they were symbolizing uh, the created things. Literally, like like uh, they personified and deified the moon, the sun, the storms, right? And they had all of these things, and 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 they became enthroned in their hearts, if you will. And, and so, if if you're thinking of it, you're settling for something less than God himself, something less than the creator. Are we any different, right? I mean, that was a long time ago. We, we, we don't do that now, right? Well, maybe we do. Maybe we do settle for things created rather than the creator, uh, whether it be ourselves and our self-image, whether it be our technology and our connectedness and even these, these rectangles that absorb us. It might be our extracurriculars or things that we really value. It might be the pursuit of fame or the pursuit of money or uh, influence or affluence. And there are religions out there that you can choose from, right, that, that actually are uh, idolatry, anything less than God, anything less than the Creator, the one who revealed Himself with Scripture, we can enthrone things in our heart. We can allow something to sit in here. And guys, here's the, the weird thing about all this old order, new order stuff. Again, if we're, we're trying to define the timeline of the Bible and trying to, trying to understand these concepts of, of the present age and the future age, when we really think about it, something is in charge of our lives. Whether or not we want to admit it, something is enthroned in our heart. That that the, the heart is a is a throne that doesn't like to sit empty. Something sitting in there. When God is not enthroned, you dehumanize yourself and others. You can see these passages here where where Israel is 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 is, is wrestling with this, where they're, they're enthroning something other than God in their hearts, and they themselves are defacing the image of God. So, guys, when we put something on our hearts that is not God, we actually become less of who we really are. Anything but God enthroned in our hearts makes us less than who we really are, and it certainly leads us away from God's tell us His end game the way he wants to go with humanity. We are working against his redemptive agenda when we dehumanize ourselves by enthroning something other than God. That's the old order. It's it's not good news, it's bad news. So what is the good news? The new order, it's really the way things should be. It's the way things God wanted humanity to walk in. Because our nature has been so shifted by the old order of things, by enthroning things other than God in our hearts, it looks a little upside down. It looks like foolishness, as the Bible said to the Greeks, or even a stumbling block to the Jews. It just doesn't look quite right. Because the king of the universe could come and be born in a place where the animals hung out. Uh, the king of the universe could come and teach and people who followed this God's self-revelation, the, the Jews of the time thought he was crazy. The perfect and flawless one would be deemed a criminal and he would be deemed worthy of death. We describe these timelines as a power struggle. Indeed, the new order is a threat to the old order. The new order is the humanizing legacy of the gospel that leads to life. When we follow Christ and become more Christ-like, it's gonna be different than the old order. The character of our lives will be different when we live into the gospel. We get to live that out in the here and now as a preview of the new order, the order that will last and is coming. We could look at a few of these passages that talk about this reinvigoration of humanity. These passages echo that God is writing this new order, his new law, his new covenant on our very hearts. Rather than hearts of stone, we in this new order in the gospel life are being given hearts of flesh that follow after God. These passages stand in opposition to what we read earlier about humanity kind of devolving and becoming less than human. These passages are about humanity recovering. What it really means to be human is to be alive in Christ Jesus in the new order. So guys, as I said it before, you become like what you worship. And guys, all of these characteristics that we see in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, the aspirational values of what it looks like to follow God and we want to be a people of kindness, of goodness, of gentleness, of self-control, of faithfulness, all of these things, the only way to get there is to become like what you worship. 
and, and we have to enthrone on our hearts this upside down kingdom's king, the king that looked like a, a servant, that king who, who the, the old order rejected, when we enthrone him on, in our hearts, we become like what we worship. We become more like Jesus, the king of the new and eternal order. When God is enthroned in your heart, you humanize yourself and others. You look at yourself differently. You look at people differently. You start to see with kingdom eyes. All of these things that we talked about with, with the, the meta narrative of scripture, the story of God dwelling with his people, the story of God coming to feast with all of humanity, woven back together at this eschatological feast, the story of family, how God is weaving together the intercultural, intertribal, international family of God. All of these things, we begin to operate and see the world differently with more optimism, with more hope. And, and I think when we do that, we, we, we then see everybody and ourselves as being made in the image of God. It changes everything when God is enthroned in our hearts. So back to inaugurated eschatology, one way to frame this is realizing that we live between two kingdoms. The kingdom that is, the broken kingdom, the old order of things, the dehumanizing legacy of sin, and the upside down kingdom, the coming kingdom, the future kingdom, the kingdom of God, the one that humanizes us with the good news of Jesus Christ. And where are we? Well, guys, sometimes we operate more in one camp than the other. Sometimes we live out the old order in our lives letting the dehumanizing legacy of sin shape and distort us. And sometimes we live into the coming kingdom where we find love and goodness and gentleness growing in our hearts as we attempt to follow Jesus in what we call discipleship, really adopting the new kingdom's values. So which kingdom will it be, youth? Which kingdom will it be, family? We play into these. Whether or not you realize it, you are in this power struggle and you are either submitting to the dehumanizing legacy of sin or you're submitting to the humanizing legacy, the upside down kingdom of the good news. So let's take a look at this passage. Galatians 5, 19 through 25 says, The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But... The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and its desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Paul is writing to the church in Galatia about this very struggle. So which king is it? You're living into one of these narratives. You're living into one of these stories. You're living into one of these kingdoms. Which king are you serving? Anything other than God or God himself? As we revisit eschatology, Meow. and specifically inaugurated eschatology, there's a timeline. There's an expiration date for the old order of things. And ultimately that upside down kingdom is where things are going. That's where this story, this meta narrative, is headed. Will we partner and submit to the old order, which is a dying order, one that won't last forever? Or will you submit to the once and future king and that way of life? Because that way of life is eternal. Let's put this thing on a map. You see how this color is blended together? Right now, it feels like we're living between kingdoms, and indeed, we are. There is the false kingdom, which if we put this thing right side up, we realize that the upside down kingdom is the one we're living in. The one that doesn't make any sense, that dehumanizes us in pursuit of the broken internal logic and desires of sinful humanity. That power struggle ultimately is a false kingdom and it can't bring us what it promises. Enthroning anything other than God in our hearts ultimately 
is a power struggle that leads to our powerlessness. It is in fact slavery to sin. And yet the kingdom of God that looks upside down and counterintuitive to our broken human reason and faculties and our desires that are compromised, it looks upside down, but the more we taste it, the more we live into it, the more we realize this is the way life should be. This is what it means to be human. This is what it means to be alive and together. That is the kingdom of God. That stuff that we get a foretaste of here in our fellowship, of our church family, of our youth group, that is the kingdom of God. That stuff is gonna last. That's where the eschaton is going. That's God's end game. We live in the place between inauguration and consummation. Let me try to, try to distill that a little bit. The cross is the moment, the decisive moment. Just like uh, you guys study World War II history. Let's do a super fast World War II primer. Here we go. D-Day is when Allied troops took the beach of Normandy by storm. This was the turning point in the war. And V-Day stands for victory. It's when they actually totally won. So between D-Day and V-Day, the tide was turning. Thanks, Wikipedia. Uh, where the, God invaded the world and, 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 and the, the tides are turning. And, and V-Day is on the horizon. God will fully consummate this kingdom. This struggle will be over one day. All of the frustrations, all of the, the road bumps, all of the, the moments uh, where it seems like God's people even were working against God's intentions. We have seen over and over again that what God intends will take place and God will plant his kingdom here on earth. And we'll call it the new heavens and the new earth and we're gonna explore that in our next Devo and to get even a better and clearer picture of the shape of our hope. But I want us to realize this at the moment. We live between two kingdoms. We live between two orders. Something is sitting and thrown on your heart, and there's a power struggle there. But you, my brothers and sisters, have agency. Will you enthrone sin? Will you enthrone anything other than God that will ultimately dehumanize you and end you? Or will you enthrone Christ Jesus, who reigns already and will reign, the once and future King, makes you more and more human for eternity. Which king do you serve? So as we've said, the kingdom of heaven is here. It's coming and it's participatory. You get to be a part of demonstrating and previewing God's inaugurated kingdom in the here and now. So guys, let's live as a preview people that shows people this upside down, counterintuitive kingdom of God is really what it's like to be human. It's a good, good story we get to live out. I've got a quote from N.T. Wright that helps us kind of distill some of these thoughts. Are you going to worship the Creator God and discover thereby what it means to become fully and gloriously human, reflecting His powerful, healing, transforming love into the world? Or are you going to worship the world as it is, boasting your corruptible humanness by gaining power or pleasure from forces within the world, but merely contributing thereby to your own dehumanization and the further corruption of the world itself? So guys, let's put it this way. You are a kingdom agent. My question is which kingdom? Don't you wanna be a kingdom agent of the kingdom of God? That's the lasting eternal way things should be and will be in a place where people are still deciding which king to serve. May we be restored as images of God, and part of that means that we represent His kingdom interests. Let's represent that kingdom that is on the horizon in here and now. And next time, we'll talk about the preview of the fullness of that end game that God is telling that kingdom come. We'll call it the new heavens and the new earth, and we'll explore what clarity scripture gives of this amazing hope we have for the end, for the eschaton. All right, guys, I hope this has been helpful. Let's be kingdom agents for the kingdom of God, my brothers and sisters. All right, Godspeed.